This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and so much to talk about today again. We've had another incredible week with the Starlink launch on Wednesday. I want to talk about SpaceX's demo mission 2, which is really starting to get exciting with the launch coming up at the end of May, and of course, Starship development updates. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Another super interesting week with Starship development. Since the last video, it did take a little longer than I expected to get the SN4 Starship moved down to the launch site for pressure testing. While we were waiting though, there was a massive number of rings shuffling around the site and disappearing into a number of the tent structures. Many of us are thinking that these are already segments not only for the SN5, but likely the SN6 as well. We were predicting that the SN5 was going to roll into the high bay as soon as the SN4 rolled out for testing testing. The blue roll lift vehicles arrived early in the week as well in preparation for the move for the SN4, so that was always exciting to see. Prior to the move though, the crew at the launch site just picked up and moved the thrust puck segment of the old SN3 out of the way out near the orbital launch pad area. Still a little unsure what the reason is for keeping this nearby at this point. If you've got any thoughts on that, please do let us know in the comments. Also spotted were the thermal protection tiles appearing not only on the top half of the main tank structure, but also two more blocks of them on the skirt section under the bottom bulkhead. We assume that they'll be testing the methods of fastening to ensure that they easily survive the vibrations in a test flight. As Elon mentioned in this tweet, the tiles are mechanically attached to steel studs. Rather than these studs being attached by making a hole in the tank, Elon replied to a stud welding example video saying that this is pretty much how the studs are to be attached. The benefit of this is that there are no adhesive adhesives needed to stick the tiles on. The fact that these are mounted mechanically means that there can be spacing applied to limit transfer of heat from the tiles to the stainless steel body underneath. It's going to be interesting to see how these tiles interlock as the design evolves. Now, before the move of the SN4 to the launch site, we were watching the SN5 build continue to evolve. The common bulkhead between the lower liquid oxygen tank and the upper liquid methane tank was sleeved with these rings. We also caught a few glimpses of a Raptor engine here out and about looking very clean as well. Shortly after, of course, we had the big move. Between coverage from Lab Padre's livestream here watching the SN4 roll past early morning, and then Boca Chica Gal's footage here watching the beast haul its way out through the fog, this again was all very spectacular to watch with the Star Hopper there at the front gate as always. Each time we see one of these massive Starship tanks come rolling into the launch site, the excitement grows with the entire community. The SN4 was picked up and lifted up onto the test stand, which had been undergoing massive amounts of work right through the week as well. This structure is looking quite evolved from when the SN3 was being tested. As always, Boca Chica Gal has been incredible documenting everything in detail. These videos are dropping daily and I'm sure you'll all agree it means a great deal to the entire community. Thank you, Mary, for everything you're doing. We all appreciate it. Mere hours after the move down to the launch site, the SN5 did indeed start to take its place in the high bay. We're wondering if the SN5 here could be ready for stacking some components together before the SN4 even begins testing, which certainly looks like that could be the case. Pressure testing could certainly be occurring over the next day or two from when this video goes live, based on some current best guesses. Now, it's actually been a while since I've talked about Crew Dragon and how big of a deal this upcoming mission is going to be. We're now just a little more than four weeks away from the proposed launch date, which is May 27th. This clip shared by both NASA and SpaceX a week ago is one that is especially inspiring. Here, in these shots, we see the incredible history at Kennedy Space Center. These same doors and this walkway are the same witnessed before I was even born for the Apollo missions. Throughout the decades of missions throughout the space shuttle era, right up to that very last space shuttle mission, this was the site we'd see. Sadly, of course, the very last crewed flight from America with STS-135 landed for the final time in July of 2011. Ever since then, the Soyuz has been the only launch vehicle to send astronauts to the International Space Station. Almost nine years, which frankly has made it seem that the industry has regressed rather than advanced, as most people assumed it would over the last 50 years. Now, since then, of course, NASA's commercial crew program has had SpaceX's Crew Dragon being developed alongside Boeing Starliner. After a long 
period of development and a number of delays, we are now only weeks away from that first crewed flight from America since 2011. This is a big deal and what is just as important in my mind is that this for the first time is a privately funded space company, SpaceX, providing the vehicle to take astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley on the Crew Dragon with SpaceX's Demo-2 mission. This is going to be the highlight of the year and based on the coverage of Crew Dragon's unmanned Demo-1 mission in May last year, this is going to be quite the spectacle. Now if you would like to know more about the Crew Dragon, I've got a video here that goes deeper into that vessel while talking over the Demo-1 mission itself. While you're here of course, please do consider subscribing, there is loads more news coming with Starlink and Starship development as well and I'd love to share all that with you. The Demo-2 mission will also be quite the nail biter I'm sure for SpaceX. This is the first flight with humans on board a SpaceX vehicle. No doubt about it, we'll all be glued to the live stream watching every moment of this mission. Now NASA will actually be running a number of news conferences on the 1st of May on NASA TV which we'll all be certainly watching. Gwen Shotwell who is of course SpaceX's Chief Operating Officer will be involved in the first conference so that will be insightful I'm sure. Bob and Doug will actually be doing remote interviews as well I believe so that's all coming up very soon. We of course had another amazing Starlink flight this week. Now this launch brings SpaceX up to 420 operational Starlink satellites. We'll talk more about that in a moment but real quick this video is sponsored by Brilliant who have been huge supporters of my channel. In these current times you may be on the lookout for online math and science resources and whether you're a student looking to get ahead, a professional brushing up on new skills or someone who just wants to use this time to understand the world better, you should check out the awesome content we with Brilliant. Each time I come back there is something amazing to learn more about. In particular I really love this introduction to neural networks. Getting this deeper understanding by interactively exploring how these 50 example neurons can classify handwritten digits just blows my mind. And what I really love about the learning process with Brilliant is that you set a goal to improve yourself and then you work at that goal a little more every day. If you're naturally curious and you want to build up problem solving skills or you need to develop confidence in your analytical ability then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new. Brilliant's thought-provoking math, science and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and then just breaking them up into bite-sized understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with their interactive explorations and over time you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support in this channel and if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. So yes, on Wednesday SpaceX launched 60 more satellites to add to the network. This Starlink mission brings SpaceX's total number of Starlink satellites launched to 422 including the initial two test satellites. Only around 412 of those are active as far as we know. A few have been deorbited and we believe that there are a few dead in orbit as well. Regardless, that is astounding progress and these Starlink launches are only going to ramp up faster as we get close to a live service date. Interestingly, the launch date had actually been pushed forwards a day earlier than announced which was quite unusual launching on the 22nd instead of the 23rd. Before diving into the mission details though I just wanted to start off by sharing this article published by NASA Spaceflight here on April 21st. Elon specifically replied to this article as well and there are some interesting reasons why this flight of Starlink happens to be quite an interesting milestone. This Starlink launch makes SpaceX's Falcon 9 the most flown currently operational rocket in America and it's just surpassed the total launches made by the Atlas V. Now this is no small thing because the Atlas V has had a huge head start flying for the first time in August 2002. In comparison the first Falcon 9 flight was launched in June of 2010 so a head start there of 8 years. This flight of Starlink makes it SpaceX's 84th flight with the Atlas V having launched its 83rd mission last month. So as this article states well this is the changing of the guard. In under 10 years is, SpaceX has become the front runner which is an astounding achievement when you really think about the extra abilities that the Falcon 9 has such as the large percentage of reusability and groundbreaking technology allowing scenes like this to play out as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Keep in mind of course that SpaceX is still the only rocket development company that has achieved reusability on an orbital class booster. I think it's also worth noting that in the early days of the Falcon 9 flight development customers and launches were accumulated really very slowly 
early. As I said, the first launch was in 2010, but by July of 2014, four years later, SpaceX hit its 10th launch. Doesn't really seem that quick, right? But by the end of the next year, SpaceX had doubled that with 20 flights. Fast forward a little more than five years to where we are now, and wow, 84 launches total. At this stage in SpaceX is not slowing down. In fact, with the frequency of these Starlink launches required to build out the world's most advanced broadband internet system, we're looking at a Falcon 9 launch every few weeks just for this project alone. There are many non-Starlink flights to be launched on the Falcon 9 throughout the year as well. As we've already talked about, the massive Crew Dragon mission is just weeks away, and as far as I can see, currently over 15 non-Starlink launches in 2020. Now, obviously that's very rough as delays for missions creep in all the time, so it's probably not going to be quite that many, but before we know it, the Falcon 9 will pass that 100th flight and will be accelerating onwards. Now, if you want to keep up to date with well-written factual space-related news, NASA Space Flight site is a critical resource for you. Highly recommend it, and thank you everyone involved in creating these resources for the community. The Starlink mission itself was another textbook flight with the main booster and the fairings once again reused. The fairing was previously flown on the Amos 17 mission in August last year. The fairing recovery ships Go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief were not even attempting to catch the fairings directly this time due to ongoing upgrades with the ships and software. Instead, the plan was to fish them directly out of the water. They were successful in that retrieval and we saw those arrive back just recently. The Falcon 9 booster previously launched Crew Dragon's Demo-1 and Radarsat missions from 2019, and also the Starlink 3 mission at the end of January this year. Now, interestingly, in the live stream, it was announced that the engine shutdown issue that occurred with the last Starlink mission was an issue relating to cleaning fluid that became trapped inside a sensor dead leg or an area where it couldn't flow, and that then ignited, causing the problem. Now, I would really like someone to explain to me exactly what a dead leg is because I must admit my knowledge of dead legs is quite limited. If you know more about that, please do let us know in the comments. So yes, another beautiful drone ship landing by the booster as well. We'll hopefully see this booster designated B1051 flying a fifth mission soon in the future. We did also get another glimpse inside the second stage tank as well, which I always love. It was only a split second, but I really wish they'd show footage of the fuel floating after engine cut off a little more as we used to see in early Falcon 9 missions. The 60 satellites were released floating gently away, being overexposed by sunlight in this wonderful shot here. We are getting closer and closer now to seeing this incredible broadband network go live. Elon Musk has just said that a private beta begins in around three months, which I'm assuming will be reserved for SpaceX employees and close family, but then a public beta should open up in around six months or so at high latitude. So this is quite exciting. I'm not sure what I need to do to get in on a beta test in Tasmania. Technically, the orbits come around quite close to here, as we can see in earlier launches when Starlink satellites were deployed just after acquisition with Tasmania. Now, if anyone can help get me into a testing process, please do get in touch. Now, every time a Starlink launch occurs, there are always reports coming in from people seeing the Starlink train passing overhead. This causes a lot of panic for those believing that the satellites will remain this bright for the full mission, but that is certainly not the case. This animation here gives us a fairly close idea to how we believe the satellites are deployed. At a lower altitude, when the satellites are raising their orbits, the solar panels are extended in a low drag configuration like this. This obviously makes them very reflective being parallel to the ground. They're also at a low altitude around 300 kilometers, so much closer to the observers. They then raise their orbits using individual ion thrusters, which places them in an operational circular orbit around 550 kilometers in altitude. From here, the solar panel orientation is set completely differently, extending radially out side on to the orbit direction to reduce drag as much as possible. So yes, the reflection the activity of the satellites at this point is vastly different to when they are orbit raising. On top of all this, of course, SpaceX are experimenting with new ways to further limit any light pollution. Just the other day, Elon tweeted here saying that SpaceX are taking some key steps to reduce satellite brightness. So yes, we're looking forward to seeing how these developments progress. Launch 9, depending on how we're counting here, is another two or three Starlink missions away. 
Now, just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. You are all quite literally turning this dream of mine of creating this content from a hobby into something much more significant. If you like what I do and you would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included exclusive roles in Discord, and you can check out some exclusive patron-only content and also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. Now, a few interesting videos I think are well worth you watching if you really love these topics. First of all, Felix here from What About It has a great interview with Robert Zubrin talking all sorts of great Mars and Starship topics. You can check that out in the video description. Also, a super interesting interview with Tim Dodd and Peter Beck from Rocket Lab the other week on the future of Electron. All sorts of possibilities there with small satellite launches, including a little enthusiasm for exploring Venus, which I find quite interesting. I'm wondering if there are some potential plans there brewing, so yes, check those interviews out. A massive thank you as well to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about the SN4 developments of the week and also presenting this amazing Pocket Rocket app for iOS. So yes, check that out. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.